Okay, I'll smile. Constance always tells me to smile. Yes, I got my booster shot. Was it yesterday? I got my booster shot the day before yesterday. <laughs> and it, it affected my memory. No. I didn't feel a thing. And uh, the only thing that I noticed was uh, that I felt like I was smiling, but I wasn't. And Constance says I looked run down and everything. Well, I took the, I took the chance to 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 rest up and everything else. But my second booster shot uh, was absolutely painless, and I've had uh, uh, no ill effects that I can I can complain about. So please, better safe than sorry, everyone. But yesterday was a freaking nightmare of of uh, all sorts of mishaps and misfires and and I tried to do a show yesterday from from my car like I, I usually do on Tuesday but it was Wednesday instead and so that was probably what set the entire universe off course I went out to my car and there was a bubble that bit, well, a huge bump in my uh, uh, front tire. And it was going to pop at any minute. And I still had to take Constance to the, the farmer's market and, and uh, the co-op and, uh, and Sprouts and then get her home and get the groceries unloaded. And then I went to the to the big old tire and got my tire fixed. But everything's OK. But the show I tried to record yesterday or to broadcast yesterday off my phone just didn't work. It crapped out on me well, this morning. I tried another little test thing with my phone to see if it was if that was the problem. You don't care about this stuff, do you? Uh, and it seemed like it worked okay, but here I am again in the my cozy chair in my living room, and uh, I uh, I hope you're seeing all of this, and I hope we're recording okay. And I'm going to redo what I tried to do yesterday in the parking lot of Sprouts. And that is, I'm reading from a book, the fourth book that uh, Chris Hyatt and I wrote way back in 1971 called Taboo, Sex, Religion, and Magic. And it was always meant, at least from our point of view, to be serious and yet at the same time uh, kind of outrageously sensational. Now, uh, it's a pretty good book. I read it all these years later. This is the fourth one, like I say, that uh, Hyatt and I wrote. And it's uh, introduced uh, by Robert Anton Wilson. And uh, I'm reading chapter 21. Uh, the way uh, Hyatt and I wrote uh, together, I would do uh, 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 pretty large s sections and subjects uh, on my own, and he would do large subjects on his own, and we'd do uh, certain uh, uh, other parts of the book that's kind of served as mortar to, to put these sections together. We would... Uh, uh, hammer out, hammer out together and giggle and drink martinis. So, but this is, this is sort of my responsibility or, or my subject uh, matter. And so it's chapter 21, 
The Knights Templar and Sex Magicians. Now remember, this was 31 years, 31 years ago, and we were writing uh, uh, more or less for a popular uh, uh, audience. The Order of the Knights Templar was founded in 1118 AD to defend the city of Jerusalem and to protect pilgrims on the way to the Holy Land. It was a religious and military order, and the knights took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. They had a secret form of reception into their order and were originally headquartered on the site of King Solomon's Temple, or the alleged site of King Solomon's Temple, hence the name Knights of the Temple or Templars. In spite of the knights' individual vows of poverty, Poverty, the order as an institution eventually amassed great wealth while guarding the trade routes to the Middle East. In 1307, the French monarch Philippe le Bel initiated a brutal campaign of persecution against the Templars, seizing their persons and property and putting them on trial. The bizarre charges against them included sodomy, spitting on or trampling upon a cross, and worshipping a skull or head called Baphomet. Whatever the validity or invalidity of the charges against them, the order was ruthlessly crushed in France and disbanded by papal order in 1312. Some historians in the last few years have made a strong case for the survival of the Knights Templar and the order's metamorphosis into Freemasonry. Whether or not this is the case, the name and legends of the Knights Templar inspired numerous Masonic degrees and rites from the mid-18th century on. I mean, I joined the de Malay when I was 14, the Order of de Malay, which is a young men's uh, Masonic or order. It was wholesome enough for us boys. And we had joint dances with the Job's daughters. With, But I digress. One of the most interesting groups f founded on the romanticized Templar legends was conceived around 1895 by Dr. Karl Kellner, a wealthy Austria Austrian paper chemist and industrialist. Kellner traveled extensively in Europe, America, and Asia Minor. It was during these travels that he, he was said, okay, now his friend Theodore Royce said that this happened. He was said to have come into contact with an organization called the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. Now he probably actually did come into contact, but, but all, we're almost dealing in legend here, okay, so. As a result of this contact, Kellner was inspired to found an Academia Masonica to preserve and teach quote, certain secrets, unquote, which he believed to be the key to the symbolism of Freemasonry, religion, and nature. To assist him in this endeavor, Kellner chose his friend Theodore Royce. Royce was a colorful man. He was born in Augsburg in 1855, the son of an innkeeper. A few months after his 21st birthday, he became a Freemason, being initiated in Pilgrim Lodge number 228 in London, which worked in the German language. What was he doing in London? On January 9th, 1878, he was raised to the third degree of Master Mason. Royce 
became a professional singer and journalist and was active for a time in socialist politics until his leftist friends suspected him of being a Prussian spy. He was indeed <laughs> a Prussian spy. Uh, he was a spy for the state of Prussia. Uh, and he was in London spying and reporting on the activities of Karl Marx's daughter. And he became a singer is quite an understatement because Theodore Royce was a fantastic operatic tenor. He even sang in the opera Parsifal at Bayreuth in Germany. Now, Bayreuth was built not as a theater to perform all sorts of shows in. No, it was built as a temple of music for, exclusively for, for many years, only one opera. And it was performed there as a magical rite year after year at a festival. And the only opera that was performed at that festival was Parsifal. It was a Wagnerian religious site, I guess you would say. And Taylor Royce sang there. I don't know if he played Parsifal or not, but uh, it was still a pretty damn good gig, okay? And you had to be the best in the world to be in Parsifal, okay? But I digress. Kellner and Royce decided to call their order Oriental Orientish Templar, the Order of the Temples of the East, or Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO. In 1902, they took steps to acquire a charter conferring powers to establish a body of the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim. This organization, or permutations of it, had long been a thorn in the side of conventional Freemasonry. With its impressive number of degrees, 33 degree, 90 degree, 95 degree, and an astounding array of titles, including Doctor of the Planispheres, Sublime Sage of the Zodiac, Pontiff of Knef, etc., etc., etc. It had a strong appeal to the curious, the serious Masonic researcher, and the dilettante. Royce and Kellner felt that it would provide a suitable structure for their purposes. The esoteric teachings of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light were reserved for an inner circle running parallel to the highest degrees of their Memphis and Mizraim rite. But just as it was the nature of the key that Kellner discussed, oh, excuse me, but what was just the nature of the key that Kellner discovered. Royce made it very clear in his September 1912 issue of the Oriflamme. Our order possesses the key which opens up all Masonic and Hermetic secrets, namely the teaching of sexual magic. And this teaching explains without exception, all the secrets of nature and all the symbolism of Freemasonry and all the systems of religion." Unquote. When Karl Kellner died in Vienna in 1905, 
Theodore Royce became the head of the OTO with all its Masonic aberrations, glorious titles, and secret keys. During his term of office as head of the OTO, Royce issued many certificates and charters. Some of these would later become an embarrassment to their bearers, bearers or their followers. The efforts to legitimize their own orders in a labyrinth of charters and titles sometimes bit them smartly on their own taboos. And as the central theme of the OTO's secret became clear and that it would say immediately be misunderstood. And it's still being misunderstood. People think they're joining a sex cult and are sadly disabused. Such was not the case with Aleister Crowley. Perhaps the most fateful step made by Royce was his appointment in 1912 of Crowley as the head of the Order for Great Britain and Ireland. Crowley enthusiastically embraced the Order and brought, it to, brought to it all his unique talents and knowledge. When Royce suffered a stroke in, two, in 1922, he named Crowley as his chosen successor to the order. He died in Munich in October of 1923. From Crowley's entrance into the OTO in 1912 until his death in England in 1947, the order played an important role in his life. The order inspired him, and he infused it with his Thelemic philosophy, life, love, life, love, light, and liberty. Today, the only legitimate successors of the original OTO are headquartered in New York. Now, remember, this is in 1991, uh, and uh, New York... Uh, uh, Grand Lodge of USA was uh, the international headquarters at the at the time, and and since then there's Grand Lodges, there's many Grand Lodges all over the world. I think uh, presently the uh, international secretary is in Gothenburg, Sweden. It is an international order with official bodies in Europe and Asia as well as the Americas. In addition to working the traditional degrees of the OTO, many local lodges give classes in yoga, meditation, Kabbalah, cer and ceremonial magic. Several produce local bulletins and magazines, and many regularly celebrate Crowley's Gnostic Mass. Also, his series of plays, The Rites of Eleusis, are regularly performed, or at least when there's a not, not a pandemic, all of this is happening, and it's slowly opening up again. While carefully preserving Crowley's legacy, the order is in the forefront of promulgating the philosophy and work of this heir, not error, but heir of the Knights Templar. So that's what you missed yesterday. I I hope you thought it was it was worth trying to hear it again. Anyway, that's that's that. Uh, and uh, tomorrow we'll pick up again with something uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, fun and unique. And uh, because it's a dreary rainy day out in Sacramento and will probably continue to rain all night anyway. Until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. I'm smiling. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.